Well, good morning, everybody. Let me extend that warm welcome that David gave to you as well. My name is James. I'm one of the pastors here. If you could come and find your seats again, draw those conversations to a close, that would be great. I have no idea how I'm meant to follow John. <laughs> and the passion that he has for Jesus is just incredible. And we're so blessed. You know, aren't we blessed as a church to be connected with our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world to the Ministry of Open Doors. Thank you so much, Lee and John, for being with us, for coming and doing the Standing Strong Conference yesterday. We really value you and appreciate you. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't be at the Standing Strong Conference yesterday because I've been away with our students. It's been our student weekend away uh, this weekend as well. I travelled back last night and I just want to encourage you and bring kind of a testimony back from that time. God is working in our students and young people. God is at work in the next generation. Yeah, praise God. It was just such a privilege, along with uh, Panache, who was on stage with the band this morning as well, and many others to get to minister and serve our students, people receiving the Spirit for the first time, people stepping out in gifts of the Spirit, sensing God's call upon their life in a new way. It's a really, really wonderful time. You know, we've been hearing about our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world. And many of you will know we're in the middle of a message series together in the book of Acts in the Bible. And we're going to look at a moment together today when the persecution faced by the early church, those first followers of Jesus, when that intensified. You'll know if you've been with us journeying through this series that kind of opposition has been there all along in the story so far. There's been some arrests, there's been some violence, there's certainly been a lot of pressure and opposition that the church has been facing. But today, we're going to look at uh, the story of a guy called Stephen, who was a leader in the early church and who became the first Christian who was killed for their faith. So this is a moment when the persecution intensifies for the early church. And you know, the reality is, if you look throughout history, and even if you look around the world today, the norm is for Christians to face opposition and persecution. Our experience here in 21st century England where, as we're going to talk about, there are pressures, there are challenges, but if we're honest, there's not really persecution. That is abnormal. That's not the norm throughout history and that's not the norm around the world today. And I believe the passage of scripture we're going to look at today has so much to teach us about opposition, about persecution, about the cost of following Jesus about the power of God's Holy Spirit to sustain us in every season and every time and place in which we find ourselves, and ultimately about how Jesus is worth it all, no matter what comes and no matter what the cost. So we're going to read scripture together. I wonder if we could stand as we read God's word. We're going to be in Acts chapter 6, starting at verse 7. We're going to read through some of 6, 7, and even into chapter 8. We're not going to read it all. It would take a long time, but we're going to read from Acts chapter 6, verse 7. Let me read this for us, and then I'll pray. It says, So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews from, of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, this fellow never stops talking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Then the high priest asked Stephen, are these charges true? To this he replied, brothers and fathers, listen to me. And now we're going to skip ahead, but basically Stephen gives this epic speech. 
And I'd encourage you to read that in your own time. But essentially, he reveals through this speech that the whole Old Testament points to Jesus and how the religious leaders have completely missed the point. They've missed the point of the law. They've missed the point of the temple. They failed to see that it was all pointing to Jesus. And they were still doing that now. We're going to jump ahead to the end of Stephen's speech. Chapter 7, verse 51. This is how he finishes. It gets pretty heated. He says, you stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Last slide, and Saul approved of their killing him. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Let's pray. Yes, Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is living and active. God, and we confess that we, as we approach passages like this, in some ways they feel alien to us, in lots of ways they feel challenging to us. But we know that you want to speak to us about both the cost and the joy of following you. And you want to empower us by your Holy Spirit to live for you and to stand with our brothers and sisters around the world. Come and speak to us. Have your way in this place, we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Why don't you take your seats again? Thank you. What I want to do just really briefly this morning is share with you four things I think this passage reveals to us. And if you're taking notes, these are the four things. Firstly, that following Jesus will lead to opposition. Secondly, that opposition cannot stop Jesus. Thirdly, that Jesus will be with you when opposition comes. And fourthly, that Jesus is worth it. First thing, following Jesus will lead to opposition. Now I know that is not the most attractive slogan for the Christian faith. If you're here as a visitor, that doesn't sound like, you know, come and sign up today, does it? Following Jesus will lead to opposition. But it is the truth. Jesus said to his disciples, in this world, you will have trouble. If you're here today and you're not yet a Christian, don't become a Christian because you think it will make your life easier. Become a Christian because all the words we've been singing today are true. Jesus is the Son of God. He lived, he died, he rose again. Through him, you can have a sins, abundant, full, technicolor, life, joy, peace, freedom. Become a Christian because there really is no other option in light of the wonder and truth of who God is. But the truth is, when you say yes to Jesus, you step into a battle. A spiritual battle, but a real battle nonetheless. We have a real enemy. Satan hates God, hates the church, hates the gospel, hates followers of Jesus, hates the advancing kingdom of God in whatever form that takes when it brings freedom and joy and hope and life. And he opposes it wherever he can. We don't seek out opposition. In fact, we're told to do what we can to live a peaceful life. Stephen didn't seek out opposition. He sought to be a witness to Jesus, but opposition came his way. And we see around the world, for so many of our Christian brothers and sisters, that opposition takes real and violent 
and even, even fatal forms in places like Yemen, North Korea, Somalia, Libya, Eritrea. You know, I'd encourage you, as David said, to visit the Open Doors website. It's been so helpful for me to, to educate myself about the places around the world where the persecution is strongest and how I can pray and support believers there. But I, but I feel like this word about opposition, it's not just an out there thing. It's for us as well. And of course, we, we wouldn't want to compare ourselves in any way to the suffering and persecution faced by so many of our brothers and sisters around the world. But perhaps in our lives and here in the UK, we face other forms of opposition. More subtle, perhaps. Not as dangerous, perhaps. But clever forms of opposition and insidious forms of opposition that can rob us of our joy and life in God. So, for example, it's easy for us to give way to a spirit of fear, isn't it? Fear about politics, fear about Donald Trump, fear about global situations, fear about where culture is headed, fear about offending people. Maybe that's a form of opposition we experience that robs us of our courage and our boldness and our joy in the Lord. It's easy to give way to a spirit of discouragement, isn't it? You know, a couple of weeks back, I had a time where I felt really, really discouraged. And it was because I was reflecting on family members and friends, people who I journeyed with in faith, some of whom had been champions of the faith for me, but who, whose faith had grown cold or who had even fallen away. You know, following Jesus can be lonely and difficult and challenging, whether we live in a context where there is overt persecution or not. That can be a form of opposition in our lives. And you know, the thing is, with opposition, whenever God moves, whenever God is moving powerfully, opposition increases. That's what happens here in Acts. The church is growing. And actually influential people in society, it says a number of priests are being saved. The kingdom of God is expanding. What immediately precedes the verses we read is that the church is getting better at caring for the poor, caring for the widows. The kingdom of God is growing and expanding in so many ways. And when that happens, the powers and principalities, both earthly and spiritually, don't like it. The Christian life is always blessing and battle. Jesus told the parable about the wheat and the weeds. They grow up together. And you know, I believe we're seeing so much of God's blessing in our church and in our community together. And we're believing for more, aren't we? More harvest, more wheat, more blessing, more salvation. We're contending and believing God for revival and restoration in our times. But friends, that's probably going to mean more battle and more weeds. You know, we read in the passage, didn't we, about Saul and he's going to become a really significant character. He's persecuting the church right now, but God's going to reach into his life and save him radically. But Paul says in Philippians 3 verse 10, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings. Knowing more of Jesus, seeing more of Jesus move in your life is going to look like more power, more resurrection life, more miraculous moving of God, more salvation, more miracles, more signs and wonders, more fruit. But it's probably going to look like more participation in the sufferings of Christ as well. And that leads us on to our second truth for today. Opposition cannot stop Jesus. You know, that's the whole story of the book of Acts. Opposition cannot stop Jesus. Stephen is martyred. A great persecution breaks out. But what purpose does that persecution ultimately serve? The gospel advances. You know, it must have been devastating and felt like a complete failure at the time when this thousand strong church in Jerusalem is destroyed and dismantled and everyone is scattered. But what's the result? The commission, Jesus, the thing Jesus said would happen, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, but not just in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It starts being fulfilled. The gospel goes out. New churches are established beyond Jerusalem. 
That's what we see around the world today as well. Opposition cannot stop Jesus. John mentioned the fact we're so blessed to have believers from many nations in our church where they've experienced persecution. And I love getting to know our Iranian brothers and sisters. And we hear in Iran and other countries across the Middle East, in places where Christianity can lead to imprisonment, can lead to torture, can lead to social rejection, even death, we hear that thousands of people are encountering Jesus. People are having dreams of Jesus and giving their lives to him. Opposition cannot stop Jesus. And of course, you know, from the comfort of our world and our lives, we need to be careful that we don't kind of romanticize persecution. Persecution is, is horrible and the suffering is real and we should pray for it to end in every place where we see it. And sadly, it's not like there's some nice, neat system where everywhere we see great persecution, we also see great fruit. There are places in the world where it looks, at least for now, like persecution is doing a pretty good job of stamping out uh, the church and the people of God. But we know in an ultimate sense that opposition cannot stop Jesus we know that the increase and advance of his kingdom will know no end. We know how the story ends. Every knee will confess. Every knee will confess. That would be interesting. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's how it all ends, isn't it? And it's true for us as well. Maybe with increased blessing, we are going to see increased battle. Maybe with more wheat, we are going to see more weeds. But God's kingdom will keep advancing. People will keep finding Jesus and responding to him and experiencing his salvation. Some months ago, a young woman from our church had a, had a dream that she felt was from God. And in that dream, she saw City Church holding a service down by the quayside here in Newcastle. And there was this angry mob that had gathered and they were shouting abuse and they wanted to stop what was happening. But at the same time, people, young people in particular, were fighting their way through this mob and this crowd because they wanted to find Jesus and they wanted to be baptised and people were getting baptised in the River Tyne. Now set aside for one moment that I think getting baptised in the River Tyne would pose serious health risks to anyone. You get the picture. I believe we're coming into a season of increased blessing. That there is a hunger for God that we're seeing amongst people that we've not seen before. But let's be sober minded as well. It will be battle as well as blessing. It will be weeds as well as wheat. But opposition cannot stop. Jesus. Following Jesus will lead to opposition. Opposition cannot stop Jesus. The third thing is this, Jesus will be with you when opposition comes. You know, if I'm totally honest, I don't actually worry too much about the church, either here or around the world. I don't worry too much about the kingdom of God advancing because I, I believe and trust in the promises of God. I don't worry about that the bit I worry about is whether I'm up to it. I don't know if anybody else feels like that. I know that the church is going to be okay. The kingdom of God is going to be fine. I'm not always sure I've got what it takes. When I hear about blessing and battle, when I hear about the wheat and the weeds, when I hear about the power of the resurrection and participation in the sufferings of Christ. There's part of me that says, yes, bring it on. But there's another part of me which says, no, thank you. I'm not sure I've got what it takes. But you know what I find so encouraging about Stephen's story is that it reveals to us that Jesus is able to meet with us in our moment of weakness and fill us with our, his Holy Spirit and equip us and give us everything we need for every season and every moment and every trial. Stephen was an ordinary human being like me and like you. 
He was a guy who the apostles saw had, you know, something of the Holy Spirit in his life and had some wisdom. And they asked if he could uh, look after some of the widows in the church, play a bit of a leadership role in the church. He wasn't a superhero. But we see see time and time again in his story that God equips him and fills him with the Holy Spirit in his moment of need for what he's facing at that time. Even to the point where he can embrace his death with courage and boldness and pray for his persecutors. And when you hear the stories of our brothers and sisters who are persecuted, that's what you hear as well. They're, They're normal people. I'm sure John would tell us he's a normal person. He's flesh and blood like the rest of us. But in his time of persecution, God has strengthened him. And God has given him what he needs for that moment, for that season, for that trial. You know, it'd be great, wouldn't it? If when you become a Christian, God just sort of downloaded all the Holy Spirit courage and boldness you're going to need for the rest of your life and for everything that's going to come. But he doesn't do that. He wants us to rely on him. He wants us to walk with him and he wants us to give us his Holy Spirit as and when we need it in amazing and miraculous ways. Jesus said to his disciples, you're going to find yourself before important people. You're going to find yourself on trial for me. Don't worry ahead of time about what you'll say or whether you can cope with it. My Holy Spirit will give you what you need and the words to say in that moment. And I find this really encouraging. And I find it encouraging because it means although we recognise the persecution faced by many is so much greater than we face, it, it means it's okay to be honest and say we struggle with opposition we might be facing in our own lives. But it also means I don't have to have what it takes. I don't have what it takes. I don't have to feel prepared for anything and everything which may come my way in life as a follower of Jesus. I don't have to anxiously survey global situations or societal trends and wonder, am I going to have what it takes in the years to come? I just have to rely on Jesus and rely on his Holy Spirit every day for what's going to come. It means I can be confident that whatever comes my way, the greater the persecution, the greater the presence of God. The greater the suffering, the closer my saviour will be. But friends, you know, if there is an application here for us as followers of Jesus, it's this. If we want to know the presence of God in our lives, if we want to know the Holy Spirit, we have to step out in mission and in risk-taking. That's when we meet with him. That's when we experience more of him. Not ahead of time. Not of a full download for everything we might be anxious about for the next three years. As we step out in radical boldness, we experience the power of the resurrection. We experience the power of the Holy Spirit. We have to step into places where we actually need him. Rather than living a sort of semi-Christian life where if we're honest, we don't really need him all that much. So I want to encourage you and challenge you. Why not take a risk for Jesus this week? Why not share your testimony with a friend at work or on your course? Why not offer to pray for somebody you know is going through a hard time? And don't just say, I'll pray for you at home. Pray for them there and then. Why not? It seems like a small thing, but for some of us, this is a step of boldness. Why not get some of those carols flyers and invite some people to our carol services? Maybe it'll go well, maybe it won't. Maybe they'll say yes, maybe they'll say no. But you will know more of the presence of God in your life and more of the Holy Spirit and you will feel alive in a new way. Jesus gave that beautiful promise, didn't he? He said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. He said, I will be with you always. But what was the context for that promise? The command to go and make disciples. That's the place where we know the presence of God, the authority in a real and deep way. Following Jesus will lead to opposition. Opposition cannot stop Jesus. Jesus will be with you when opposition comes. And the final thing I want to say before we pray and we worship is this, that Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth it. A couple of years ago, I was part of a discipleship group with some friends of mine. 
uh, with Ross there doing the, the sound for us today, with Phil and Joe and, and with our friend Amir, who's here somewhere as well. I did see him earlier. And we'd meet up every couple of weeks and we'd share our story and we'd be real and vulnerable about the things we struggled with and we'd pray and we'd practice some spiritual disciplines and we'd memorize scripture and it was a great context for growing in our faith and I will never forget the week when it was Amir's turn to share his testimony and his story. Amir was from Iran and he was from quite a wealthy, privileged family in Iran. He'd been sent to uh, private international schools. His family had had quite a bit of money. They had businesses. But when he became a Christian, he had to flee from all of that and leave all of that behind because of persecution. He had to leave behind his wealth, his status, his family. He had to travel first to Turkey and then across Europe. His life was in danger at several points on that journey. But through it all, he ends up in the UK, he ends up in Newcastle, he ends up in Biker, and he ends up at City Church. He gets a flat in the Biker wall, and you know, it's hard for people who come as asylum seekers to get established in life and find work, and as, as he's telling us his story, that, that's all what he's facing as well. And we're sitting there listening to this story, and, and I'm so aware of all my privilege and comfort and how easy it's been for me to follow Jesus. And at the end of his story, Amir looked at us and he said, I'm happier now than I've ever been in my entire life. Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth it. Friends, that's the testimony of Stephen. That's the testimony of John. That's a testimony of so many of our brothers and sisters here in the church who've experienced some of this and brothers and sisters around the world. It's a testimony of Amir. Jesus is worth it. In every moment of opposition, in every moment of sacrifice, in every moment of persecution, in every costly, radical step we take for him, in every bit of suffering or opposition or pain we might experience for him, we will discover Jesus is worth it all. I wonder if we could stand together and the band could come up. And I'd just love to ask you, John, to just come and pray for us to know more of the Holy Spirit. Pray for us where we might feel we face opposition. Pray for us to be bold and courageous in sharing our faith. And then we'll worship God. Could you come and share? Pray for us now, John. Thank you. Yes, holy God, Yeshua, Adonai, the God of the Bible, the way, the truth, and the life, the one who came all the way from heaven to rescue us, and he gave us his name. And his name is Jesus Christ. He gives us victory. And there is a name in his power. There is, there, is, there is power in his name. There is salvation in his name. There is life in his name. So Lord, come right now. Send your Holy Spirit. Refresh us. Give us the boldness of faith. Give us your joy. Because we believe that your joy is our strength and it's all about you thank you so much jesus christ yeshua adonai for the radical preach for the story of stephen and for the stories in the bible and we declare our hearts to you we repent we repent lord we repent to you and we back to you and we need you we need you in this walk I can't do it myself. I need you. I need you to walk before me, Lord, and to guide me and to send me to my neighbors, to my friends, to my pe people, and to wherever I go, because you said go to the whole nations. And thank you so much, Lord, for this church, for what they are doing for the nations, for the people from Iran, from uh, Africa, from Pakistan, from other countries from india so thank you lord for this lord we are one in christ we are one in christ one faith one baptism one god and his name is jesus christ we love you we ask you to give us the boldness of faith we we thank you as well for the uk 
In the past, many missionaries came out of the UK and they went all the way to India, Middle East, Africa, everywhere. And Lord, I pray right now, you will do that again. We trust in you that you will send many missionaries from the nation of the UK. You will send them and we start from here. The people, they will start to share their faith. Because Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. For the gospel is the salvation to the whole nation. Hallelujah. And we declare the UK for Christ. Newcastle for Christ. Hallelujah. We love you, Lord. And you are holy God, Jesus Christ. Amen.